the Roommates Podcast. This is a podcast about rheumatology and it stars me, Jack and my friend Mike and we try to make sense of the complicated world of rheumatology and musculoskeletal practice. <laughs> So welcome back to Roommates. We, we're recording on AHP um, day today. So we have found another AHP to, um, to get onto our Roommates podcast. I was going to call us a ship because Roommates sounds a bit like um, shipmates, but um, never mind. It's just me rambling on about nothing. But we've got with us um, David, who's a podiatrist, and he's going to introduce himself in a minute. But we're going to talk all about things feet um, on this podcast and um, how inflammatory pathology might present in the feet and what David's experiences are of that. And then we'll have a bit of a chat around all things feet and, and ankles, I suppose, as well. Um, so, David, welcome to our little podcast show. Do you want to just give us a bit of an introduction to yourself and your uh, sort of truncated career to date? Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, my name's David Goyer. I'm a, a podiatrist, podiatric surgeon working in Essex. Um, I first graduated in 1997 um, from University College London and what was the London Foot Hospital. Um, I've worked in private practice for a long time. I worked predominantly for the NHS um, and worked really across all subspecialties of um, podiatry, so of diabetes, the biomechanics, um, and, and my main stay now is, is the surgery. And so other than the surgery, I spend, you, you spend 99% of your day giving people off-the-shelf insults. Is that about? No, I don't. That's a really small part of it. <laughs> yeah, so over-the-counter orthotics is, um, they're not the panacea. Um, <laughs> they form a useful adjunct to a lot of stuff, but yeah, not a lot of time doing that anymore. Fair enough. No, that's fair enough. So tell us a little bit, I mean, um, Mike and I have been on this show talking about inflammatory pathology quite a lot but tell us a few um sort of uh, presentations that you you might expect to see in your foot and ankle clinic what's what sort of bread and butter for you from an inflammatory point of view from an inflammatory arthritic point of view I mean, common things are common so um very typically um i would say probably gout is the most common um, presentation that, that kind of comes through the clinic that has been missed um, but again, it's kind of this, this history that kind of gives it away. And, and so many of the patients that I see are kind of late and middle-aged, may have some kind of comorbidities, which may affect renal function as well. But that kind of very acute, aggressively um, swollen, painful, red, hot, tomato type of joint. But by the time they've come to see us, has generally settled down. But it hasn't been picked up by the GP or... or wherever the patient has come from. So that's definitely the most common. And I think I would just always be wary. I mean, if in doubt, think gout is something I was told um, years ago. And I think it's a really good mantra to go by because of how common it is. Don't just think big toe joint. I've seen a lot of uh, mid-tarsal, central tarsal, metatarsal joint, subtalar um, gouty presentations that are, when you then look at it, it's pretty classic. So I think that's the most common. One that I think is missed a lot is, is psoriatic arthritis. Um, come on to rheumatoids uh, shortly, but the, 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 the dactylitis is always a big, is a big clue for me. And I reckon we get probably half a dozen or so of those a year, usually young female patients um, with swollen and lesser digit that has been up for quite a while and it's quite painful and then when you take the kind of again coming back to a careful history there is often that skin involvement somewhere along the line and i think close examination of nails is really important with that so just looking for that uh, lateral onycholysis um, salmon pink discoloration is just a really just just some really subtle signs with it um, and in rheumatoid um I think I kind of look out for this a lot. We see an awful lot of forefoot pathology and the vast majority of that forefoot pathology would be a kind of non-traumatic synovitis. The degenerative change of a, of a plantar plate will be the most common and that's generally this kind of insidious onset in, in middle-aged patients. But when you've got the forefoot pain that comes in, particularly with swelling and again in younger patients, 
to me, kind of always just sets the alarm bells of I think we must be thinking of something inflammatory as an option. So I think they're the three, from an inflammatory point of view, the biggest ones that I, I would see. Yeah, and I think um, exactly what you've said there mirrors what my understanding from probably the most common pathologies of the foot from an inflammatory point of view would go from. Um, I know that, you know, gout is the most um, common inflammatory arthritis. Um, and um, obviously we're looking at the first MCP as the most common, uh, MCP, MTP, um, as the most common location for that. Um, and interestingly, interesting that you get those referred in, you you would you would hope that those were being picked up in um, in GP surgeries, but I wonder, do you, have they had um, have they had normal uric acid tests or something like that? Is there something that you would you could say you know commonly someone's just e- either they've not paid attention to what the symptoms are or, or they've you know they've had a negative blood result or something? Generally, I think it, it, it's number one. It's on the end of a leg, and most people kind of are really good towards it, when it gets to the wrist and it gets to the ankle. Um, and GP's the same. I mean, I, I, when I did my independent prescriber, I did a really good GP who would openly say, no, I just don't do feet. And, and they've got a lot on their plate. So someone that comes in and they've got a kind of, in the end, a couple of minutes consultation mm-hmm. that you may not get a good historian. You may have been thinking about the kind of really important patient that you're sending off for a two week referral, the one that was in before. Um, and I think that just often gets missed. Um, a lot of them are sent in and they've had a uric acid, which could be just done at the wrong time. And I think that that's a, a big one with these is they see the GP and they get the uric acid done in the middle of the acute flare and it's normal. And so the, the, rather than kind of looking at a clinical diagnosis, which is what I would always go for, um, they're looking at a, at a test diagnosis and it's going to be fine. So I think that's the biggest one where they're not picked up. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, and then those other ones you mentioned, um, uh, sort of subtalia and things, I think they're probably a bit more of an unusual presentation. There would be, I, I would be less surprised at those slipping through the net than um, certainly in a first MTA. Yeah, absolutely. But then it just comes back to that very methodical, reproducible, almost kind of anal way of taking a history. So just doing it the same way every time. Um, and when you then start talking about, well, this came on quite suddenly, often nocturnally, lasted seven, 10, 14 days, and kind of went away on its own, it's been okay. Immediately, you're kind of building that picture. So as long as you're answering, asking those same questions in the same way all the time, you, you extract that information. I think that's the way of dealing with it. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I'm interested in the dactylitis patients as well, because you mentioned about most of them being younger females. And um, I was on a, did a, a watched a webinar this last week about uh, axial spondyloarthritis in females and um, and, uh, and women, and it, they they were um, very strong on the fact that the extra articular manifestations were much greater in ladies than they are in men, or more likely, especially related to psoriasis. Um, so you you confirmed that immediately, which is very convenient for me. Um, the tell us a little bit about because I don't think a lot of physios have seen dactylitis. I mean, outside of rheumatology clinic, I'm not sure I've ever seen it. So, um, tell us a little bit more about sort of how dactylitis presents, what you might see when it comes in, um, the sort of the feeling of it, that kind of thing. I, it's a classic sausage, sausage digit. I mean, and, it, and it's a really from the food school of pathology, which a lot seems to be. Um, it's exactly like that. It's a little chipolata and it's not a swollen joint because it's the whole digit that's involved fairly evenly. Usually one of the central three digits. I don't think I've seen it in a, in a fifth toe. I don't think I've seen it in a hallux, but certainly one of the middle three. Um, usually only one I've seen and usually unilaterally is what I've seen. I don't know how that's backed up with, with what you've seen. Um, and again, quite a sudden presentation. The pain doesn't always come with it, but it's usually a bit uncomfortable. Um, but certainly on examination, it's sore, certainly wearing footwear. It tends to be an even colour. So it's not kind of a patchy, mottled, bit of cyanotic, bit pale. It's all a bit red. 
a little bit of erythema, a little bit of um, increased temperature. And I always like using infrared thermometer for, for looking at temperatures, even in any inflamed joint. And, and prior to when we started using um, ultrasound as much as we do, infrared thermometry was, was a really useful little adjunct because you can only use, I think you can get probably, be aware of a three degree Celsius difference when you're touching. So something that measures by, by fractions of a degree is really useful. Um, sometimes I've seen some trophic changes of the skin with the dactylitis, sometimes a little bit of hyperhidrosis as well. Um, but there, that's the kind of the typical presentation that I would see. Yeah. Um, I know, I'm not sure about you, Mike, but I, I have seen multiple digits, but um, they do tend to be on one limb am i right into one one hand one foot one they don't, i haven't seen i've seen maybe a one or two presentations where they've had them on on more than one one um foot or 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 hand but i've seen i um, saw one girl i remember she was in her tw early 20s she had three toes on on one foot for all that size but but my, mine was a sort of more um i mean, I mean being or was already in rheumatology is more of a uh, sort of a directed caseload we're already going to see mm. the worst ones so i'm not surprised about that but if you see is that mirror your your um experience mate um i must say all of the dactylitis i've seen tends to be one digit and it's most often the third toe that i've seen um that's involved um it's always difficult because psoriatic arthritis patients tend to be patients who have existing metabolic disease. So they're often a bit overweight, um, you know, and, and they've, they've got these kind of pudgy digits already. So sometimes it's a bit difficult without an ultrasound to actually decide if, if there is only really actually one digit involved. Um, and a lot of the time I'm not, I'm, I'm sure you also experienced this, David, is if you've really got an angry dactylitic digit, often that swelling and, and kind of puffiness spills over to the fourth digit as well. Um, so that's sometimes it, it really confuses things. But if you get a probe on, on there, you can, you can kind of see the fluid in, in the flexor. Um, tendon sheet and the extensor tendon sheet and the hyperemia and, and it just looks angry. Um, mm. So I, I, I can't say I've ever seen someone with three, Jack. So I think you, you, you struck gold there. Well, <laughs> I don't know <laughs> if that's the case, but um, certainly, yeah, that was, that was a pretty angry foot. Yeah, it was a pretty angry foot. Um, yeah, I was just thinking not all of us have the access to the uh, lovely machines like you have, Mike. Um, to, to ultrasound things, but it, it's, uh, I mean, ultrasound, in my opinion, is going up in my usefulness of, um, of things that you could have in clinics for us. Yeah, it's really you useful. Know, I, I, I also find with the psoriatic arthritis patients, David, I'm, I'm sure you've also experienced this and yourself, Jack, is sometimes you get caught between a rock and a hard place where someone comes in with what sounds like a history, which could be fitting of gout, they have a raised serum urate, you know, they maybe take a few extra pints. They may be a little bit overweight. So they fit the gouty kind of profile quite well. And you treat them with allopurinol and you get their urate in target level, but they still have these attacks and, and you dig a little bit more and the brother has psoriasis or there's a cousin with psoriasis and, and they actually end up having PSA. Um, so I often, we've had a few cases in our community service where Often there's a, a, a psoriatic arthritis masquerading as a gout. I'm not sure if you've ever come across that. I had, I had one of those exactly last year, or it's actually just before lockdown, where it was a fourth toe uh, distal interphalangeal joint. So DIPJ, I'm, I'm immediately kind of going for, for psoriatic arthritis. The history fitted with it, family history, skin manifestations. Um, but... The, the onset of it, the, just the amount of swelling and the fact that it got better within a couple of weeks just made me think twice. Now, unfortunately, the poor fellow's got both things going on. And then there's nothing saying you can't have both. So on, on x-ray, he had kind of typically erosive changes, but he also had that kind of well-demarcated C-shaped erosion, um, typical of gout. 
and his uric acid was through the roof. But the thing that kind of got it down was getting his uric acid down, and that settled it. And his, his psoriatic arthritis, whilst radiographically pretty horrible, doesn't give him too much of a problem. Mm. Yeah, and like, like Mike says, the um, psoriatic arthritis patients especially do tend to carry a lot more comorbidities like you said that i know that they're on average they're more overweight than rheumatoid arthritis patients they have a higher level of depression higher level of smoking those sorts of things they're going to lend themselves to things like gout so there is going to be quite a lot of a lot of crossover like you said what it's not like having psoriatic arthritis is protective against having gout is it so it's, <clears> you're going to get a few that double up it's a really difficult um a difficult spot to be in because you like which one do you treat which one do you um hope just settles off if they can be a bit more healthy etc or do you try and treat both and really hit them with medications that's going to be it's going to be a real challenge and i suppose if someone sticks a steroid in it it's going to treat both and not help you at all mm. that's what mike does isn't it steroid everything <laughs> well not since not since march jack <laughs> put those needles away <laughs> yeah no they're all expired now uh, yeah. so I think oh, psoriatic arthritis in general is just, it's just a different animal, isn't it? Because oh. um, rheumatoid is, is quite a textbook presentation. You know, you get that, that MTPJ swelling, they positive on a squeeze test. It often starts in the fifth MTPJ. Um, and if you look in the hands and, and the other joints, you're bound to find something. Whereas PSA, it, it it could just be the most obscure entheses of the most obscure digital ligaments that you've never even heard of before that have inflammation. And you see this kind of whiskering on, on the plane radiograph. And I often find it super difficult with, with PSA um, as compared to, to rheumatoid. I don't know if, if you guys have similar experiences. Yeah, oh, well, yeah, without a doubt. And I think it's kind of that, to, to kind of just say, well, sorry, I have to offer, it's just dactylitis. And, and we know that that's not the case. I think that is a really difficult one. And again, for me, it's one that you, you get to by exclusion, really, of the other stuff. And then it's not, you're not going to have the answers at first consultation all of the time. There, there is going to be a little bit of digging to do. Um, and you don't always get them right. I mean, sometimes you only find out what it is once you've sent it to somebody cleverer, which is what I generally do. Because um, if I can't put a screw in it, it's got to go somewhere else. That's like Mike, if you can't put a steroid in it, it's got to go somewhere else. Um, I was going to say the uh, the psoriatics I find as well, we've, we've got all this, there's a lot of promotion of Axial Spa across social media, the regular media, et cetera. But we don't see a lot of promotion across for peripheral spa and um it's i don't know if that's just because there's not enough data or we just it is more difficult to pick up but they are a real challenge those patients it's easier if they've got a really good going inflammatory back pain you can pick them up relatively easily but these like you said these nuanced sort of subtle signs in people who generally maybe not as that healthy anyway they're just so hard to pick up and i think there's a lot of them languishing getting um, Achilles tendon rehab or um, <laughs> insoles or steroid injections or whatever it is and not actually being diagnosed and I think what well, ultrasound would probably help in that regard but um, like you said David I think a really solid history and really digging to get into past medical history and family history as well is going to be really important especially in those yeah. females um, they're going to women are going to be really difficult to pick up I th yeah I think that the, the history underpins everything and generally, I don't know what you found, Mike, but we, I mean, I've had a few raging psoriatic arthritis, um, Achilles enthesopathies, look entirely the lovely homogenous tendons on um, ultrasound, even the kind of the, the morphology, the heel is relatively unaffected, but they're really quite painful and, and swollen peritendon. Yeah. And, um, a little bit of increased activity at the insertion. And, and you, you can chuck all of the um, rehab at them. It, they're just not going to work. But it's that history that kind of comes back. Yeah, for sure. And I think, I think when you've got someone in who's had, like you said, they might be in for seeing you for that, for heel pain, plantar fasciitis is the other classic one, isn't it? Might be in seeing you for that. But then you've, you've sort of asked them about it and they've had two lateral epicondyle tendon problems and a 
lateral glute and you go what they're not diabetic or anything like that and you're like why have you had four of these tendon problems in the last Mm. year or 18 months or something and then that's that even if they've improved over time i think that that's where we need to start then digging a lot more is is people i think are and it's easy to do isn't it it's like like we were talking about is if you're in a busy clinic and you've got a lot of patients to get through and you go oh i've got an achilles tendinopathy i know what to do with that and give them a loading program and off they go um and it it's very easy to slip into that and then misdiagnose someone quite easily with these things because they are relatively subtle yeah, I think that kind of the misdiagnosis, you can always be forgiven for that, I think. But it's just what is then happening when they don't respond as you would expect. And, and it's just having that ability to kind of, well, think again. Um, and I've known, I mean, I, I got this from neurology of all, of all places. So I think they're one of the best historians uh, or history takers. And I've seen neurologists just say, I'm not, there's something I'm missing. And they've gone back to first principles and treated the patient as a new patient two or three times and just got over the same thing to dig out the bit that they missed. And, and those kind of three appointments were much more worthwhile than then kind of treating somebody for half a dozen appointments, 10 appointments and getting nowhere. Um, and I think that that's always worthwhile. If it doesn't sound right to you and it's not working, trust yourself and go back and look at it again. Mm. Yeah, for sure. I think that's definitely the case. And I think it's being brave enough to say sometimes even, you know, what could do with another set of eyes, like we've tried this, it's not working. I'm biased because I did the first assessment and that's what I found. I'm going to get David and Mike to see you start from scratch, see what they think. If they think the same thing, brilliant. If they've got a different idea, let's try something else but it's you know i think we've got we've got this problem we where we're like you know you've got to give enough time for things like exercise programs to work to settle in to have an effect general health we know that's going to take a lot a while to if you give someone some dietary advice or sleep advice it's not going to be work it's not going to be better by next wednesday is it so we've got this offset between we've got to give those things enough time to work but not so long that we're just being stubborn at our first treatment program <laughs> being the thing we think is going to work and then moving onwards when it's not working. So some at some point in your plan, there's got to be this, um, this sort of um, allowance to change tack if necessary, I think. Yeah. And I think that that's, I've never met a patient who was unappreciative of that. So I, I think kind of it shows that you're really thinking about that case and, it, and, and that translates into how much you're caring for the patient that you're looking after. And I've never had a patient who's been averse to me saying, I'm not quite sure here. Can, can we just get somebody else to have a look at that? Not once. Where I've had lots of patients who've been more unhappy that you kind of try to pursue the same thing and it's not working. Mm. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I think sometimes we, <clears throat> we also forget that a lot, a lot of these kind of degenerative or, or let's say tendinopathic presentations can also have strong elements of inflammatory behavior to them. So it's often quite complex. I mean, how many Achilles tendinopathies do we see that still have a good 10 or 15 minutes of stiffness in the mornings and they're much better with exercise and they've got rest associated stiffness and, you know, it's, it's not always black and white. Um, and no, but I think you can sieve that out though. Again, I sound like a broken record. You come back to that history and they say, well, yeah, it's stiff first thing in the morning. Well, come out long for, and it's that first kind of, well, until I've been to the bathroom, come back, I'm fine. Or actually it's still like it an hour later. And I think that's the, yeah. the, the thing with it. And again, with, with, the, with the use of ultrasound, which I kind of, um, I could not practice without these days. Um, it, it just opens up a whole a different ball game for you and does give you a little bit more information. Yeah. I'm doing ultrasound um, virtually. Can you, <laughs> we need ultrasound people with USB up plug in ultrasound pros. <laughs> Go on Mike. And, sorry. I can't um, go. What Dave, what, what do you think the, the current sentiments are amongst your um, podiatry colleagues? Uh, you know, if you do get a patient who's, who's having some warning bells, maybe they've got an insertional Achilles enthesitis or they, they've got a possible dactylitic joint and it's all, all seeming a bit inflammatory in nature. 
do you think podiatrists are, are definitely looking towards the other foot and the hands and looking at other joints? Do, or do you think that's something that's more in the pipeline for future developments? Or? No, I think, I mean, in a, in, a, in a foot and ankle examination, you always look at the other one. You, you, you never look at the kind of the one that comes in and that... that that if I kind of have a little look around clinics and, and you've got kind of a, a, a more junior colleague perhaps, and you'd hope it would be a more junior colleague that's just got one foot out and they're having a look at there's something wrong there. Nature's giving you this kind of wonderful comparison to, to go with or actually something that backs up a symmetrical finding. So you always look at both. And yeah, good colleagues would always look at other joints and question those other joints particularly the small joints, the kind of hands and feet often mimic each other in, in, in some in the inflammatory arthropathies. So yeah, I think they would. And then again, that kind of questioning about, do you got any other pain elsewhere? Not that we're any good with it, because we get lost at the kind of the ankle, but... Physios aren't very good at it, believe you me. <laughs> I think it, it's one of those things as well, isn't it? Like if you start, um, I always thought this when I was seeing in MSK clinics, someone comes in with an Achilles tendon problem and you start asking them about their hands and their elbows and things like that. It's, it sort of jogs them. So you know, sometimes you'll be like, oh, have you got any other joint problems? They're like, no. And then you go, can I have a look at your hands? They go, oh, I had this wrist pain last year. You're like, so when I asked you about your joint pains and you said no, you just forgot about that entirely. But sometimes they don't, it's not the patient's job to do your job for you, is it? You, you Sometimes you have to guide them a little bit to understand the questions that you're asking and ensure they know that all the, all the joints are what you're interested in, their back, their hands, everything. Um, so sometimes I think even just that little bit, and you mentioned nails as well, David, I'm sure you, you know, if you're not just looking at toenails, you're obviously looking at fingernails. And then once you start Absolutely. in that upper limb area, then it just jogs them to be thinking about other things that they've had or might remind them. And um, the same thing when they, you know, the number of times you get someone come in the next appointment and they go, oh, I, I said no family history. And I asked my mum and it turns out that, she's got five sisters with rheumatoid arthritis. You're like, ah, mm. oh, that's the, like you were saying, that's the thing I missed. Um, clearly there's huge family history that, you, that that person's just not aware of at that time. And then you adapt to the new information. Yeah, absolutely. And I think again, it, it, it comes back to this kind of history is, well, the patient's going to tell you everything that's wrong. That they are going to tell you, but you've just got to, I think, structure what you want to find out first. What is the information you're trying to get and can you do it in a way where you're building this kind of partnership and, and, and um, transfer of, 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 of information that they're quite comfortable with doing? So again, it comes back to what, what you really want. What do you want to find out from this consultation? What is it? And, and when we're dealing with pain, which is what we're dealing with most of the time, those, those questions are exactly the same. And where I'm lucky is I'm dealing with the same bit every time. So the way I examine it can be exactly the same pretty much every time with a few tiny little adjustments for different pathologies. Me and Mike sitting here going, oh, I wish we'd trained in one, <laughs> I knew you said one joint, I don't mean one joint, one area. <laughs> but yeah, big toe joint is what, it's about 90% of it. So yeah, it is about one joint. <laughs> yeah, it was when I was in yeah. orthopedics. I, I went on a, a spondyloarthritis course at Leeds University um, earlier this year, kind of, I think it was February time, pre-COVID, and it, it was really great, the setup they had there, because they actually had a, a, a I think she, I stand under correction, whether she was a podiatric surgeon or a podiatrist, but essentially her root profession was podiatry, and she, she was actually an essential member of, of the rheumatology team. She saw early inflammatory arthritis patients, um, you know, and, and was actively involved in decision making of escalating treatment and de escalating treatment, um, doing ultrasounds, doing foot injections, and so forth. And I just think, in, in perfect AHP spirit, I think it would really be good to have podiatrists more involved in rheumatology departments, particularly EIA departments, um, early arthritis clinics with feet, because I mean. I can't speak for, for the rheumatology um, consultants, but for myself as an AHP, often feet confuse me and it would really just be good to have colleagues there. And I really like the setup they have there. Um, I, 
I just think it's sad that we, we don't have that luxury in other trusts. It is certainly something I would like to see. And I know that there are lots of colleagues who would relish being part of an MDT because you can take, particularly if you get the right kind of mix of people, you look at the example, I think, where you, with diabetes, where the, the, the role of MDTs within that is priceless uh, and actually saves lives and saves limbs. And I think the quality of life changes that if a properly structured rheumatology MDT was set up, I think it would be really good. I know there's a couple of papers that I've read that, that say it doesn't really make a difference, which I found interesting, but I just can't believe that they've got the mix right. Yeah. And I suppose it probably varies between different locations because you're probably going to have, like, you know, if you had someone in your rheumatology clinic, say they're a physio, for just for example, but they happen to have spent a good period of time working with feet, then you might not necessarily gain a huge advantage from having a foot specialist come into that team because you someone's doing 85 90 percent of that already and then you're just sort of topping up on top but then if you've got someone if you've got a clinic where no one's specialized in feet for either a long time or at all then you could have quite a larger improvement if you know what i mean i think the same same with spines you could have the, you could make the same argument couldn't you with their spines are incredibly complicated and difficult and messy and hard to manage and i think if you again if you had so someone in your team who'd done a lot of that and then you brought in someone who was specialist at it you probably wouldn't get quite so much of a of an improvement um i think certainly it would it definitely needs to be evened out doesn't it you can't why have we got like you said mike why have we got one place where they're where podiatrists are deep a, a podiatrist is deeply embedded in the mdt and then most other places we've ever been to it isn't so there's got to be certainly a reason for that yeah, I think it, it probably all just boils down to, to funding, I guess, at the end of the day. Um, and I guess skills is, you know, do, do you have um, podiatrists? I would imagine there's a massive amount of podiatrists who would be very keen to, to train and, and specialize in that area. It's just having the opportunities, I guess, for, for people to pursue those pathways um, is, I don't know, David, if you're aware of, of any of those pathways for your colleagues. They don't exist, but I think they should. And I think kind of your, your example of kind of making a pathway, I think is where it comes from. And, and podiatry historically has been very good at that. That the whole reason that podiatric surgery exists because well, it was made to happen by a kind of a few generations of, of clinicians ago. And the same with the, um, the diabetic pathway, that there was a real necessity for that and an involvement with someone who was really kind of acutely involved in the wound care, debridement, casting side of things. And it was a real natural place for, for podiatry to be. But you've got to have the will within the acute trusts. And, and, and that's really where it comes down to. Now, when you then get into community-based consultant-led services, if there is a will there, I think you can make a very good case for it as well. So it, it, yeah. there's a real opportunity there. I kind of see that the, 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 the lack of that real pathway is more of an opportunity to make one. Because there are some yeah. really fantastic rheumatology specialist podiatrists around, but they are, they are the exception, I think. Well, hopefully rather than one a trust hopefully we've got some consultants listening and then they can uh, take it up take up the mantle and think god I could, i'd enjoy having a podiatrist in my team that'd be useful and uh they can um, they could start paving the way and then hopefully if we get get some podiatrists doing the same thing and they can meet in the middle and crack on with those pathways i think hmm. i think it'd be well, i think it'd be excellent i mean we have specialist hand therapists don't we um in most rheumatology departments and there's no reason feet are just equally as affected so i don't see why we shouldn't have the foot specialists as well yeah agreed so i i was in i was really interested david in in getting your um kind of i guess i guess summary or or crash course for for our msk listeners and colleagues is if you if you had to give your kind of top tips um for for feet 
um, in, in terms of if we think in inflammatory arthritis or arthropathies, what, what, what would your suggestions be for, for the MSK practitioners out there? In terms of what to, to look for or how to? Well, I, I think in terms of history, in terms of what to look for. And I mean, if in your experience, if, if you could give kind of a few examples of tell, telling presentations or, or kind of, you know, your, your kind of telltale signs that would make you think of a particular pathology, what, what advice would you give? Okay, so I think if, if we link that back to, to my very structured methodological history, um, I use the kind of the old Karts mnemonic, um, which just is a really nice one to hang pain on. Are you, are you aware of old Karts? You've heard of that before? Yeah. So it, it's onset, location, duration, character, aggravating factors, relieving factors, time of day and severity. That, that kind of those things will just give you those clues already. So the sudden onset, sudden onset of pain really then started making me think rather than something that's just been grumbling on location with the, the patterns that kind of, I'm sure everybody listening is well aware of with the inflammatory arthropathies. If we're talking at the MTPJ level, relatively symmetrical, or are we talking a distant toe? Or are we talking then thesis? That's going to give you some clues with the inflammatory arthropathies. Um, the character of the pain. I mean, I think we're talking this, this typical inflammatory, sharp soreness. It's not going to be the tingly pins and needles, generally speaking. It may not be the deep ache. It's going to be quite severe as well. With the aggravating factors, the one that kind of gets me is pain after rest not necessarily mechanical pain and, and things that relieve it. Well, there isn't really much that relieves it. I just wait for the pain to go. They are the sorts of things that the long-standing post-static pain that goes away after a while makes me think time of day again, first thing and, and nocturnal pain always kind of bothers me. That, that's, that's something with that. And then severity, which is a difficult one because I've never met a patient who says that they've got a poor pain threshold. So <laughs> everyone has got a really high pain threshold and then you find out that they really haven't. Um, so the severity is there. I would always then question them regarding any subjective swelling, redness, shape change. So is there a morphological change? People notice that subtle flattening out of the foot. They'll notice a digital deformity, perhaps an ab abduction at the MTP of the digit, or slight flexion deformity of the digit. That's um, important. Does it make them limp? Are they taking painkillers? Does it disturb their sleep? So again, this gives you some sort of idea of how, how bad it is. And I think a really important one, no history of trauma. I mean, that kind of speaks for itself. And then uh, my touchy feely bit with it, not literally, is the ice mnemonic. So kind of asking the patient what they think the problem is. Because often they're pretty well educated, a lot of patients these days, and they have a good idea of what it might be, what their concerns are. Because if they've got a family history, particularly with the rheumatoid, and they've seen somebody that's had quite a disabling disease, their concern may only be that they just don't want to turn into that rather than they can live with the pain. But they just don't want that progression. And then what do they expect from your treatment or consultation? So I think that that's from, from the history point of view, they would be the things that would kind of make my ears prick up for, for inflammatory arthritis. And then kind of the, the examination, I, I tend to kind of keep the same. But if, if you wanted to go through that, we can. But my examination of the foot and going pretty much the same every case. Yeah, I think it's it's yeah. being it's remaining vigilant as well, isn't it? Like you say, with whatever mnemonic you use or however you repeat your consultations, the same. It's about you need to know sort of the demographics and that these patients do tend to be younger. So you know it, that you're keeping vigilant for things, and I think from a physiotherapy point of view, we've learned a long time ago that with things like back pain, we 
we're really quick to ask red flag questions Mm. Um, things like that and then as soon as you get away from that central area and you get into the periphery you think everything's hunky-dory and safe and you're in safe territory and nothing really goes wrong so uh, especially in sort of younger patients and then a lot of these patients like you said they're worse with the rest they they can still play sport so because and they're better with like at the gym and things like that so people are immediately sort of settled by that they don't feel like they need to worry about these pay- people and i think their vigilance dips off vigilance dips off and because they're just not not quite aware of how many of these patients there are and how they do present so i think that staying vigilant and like you said making sure you go through that process with every single person um and you yeah, don't, don't relax into corners. don't cut corners yeah exactly i think that's super important and it's a really, it's, I think it's a discipline that's really well worth um, practicing. And, and the other thing is, you only, it's an old mantra, isn't it? But you only diagnose what you know, and, and you only know what you diagnose. And I think kind of just that consistent and just lifelong desire to want to know more. I mean, I, I've always learned more by kind of a patient coming in or being di- diagnosed with something I've never heard of. And then going away and spending some time reading about that, and and that's the way you, I think you learn most about these sorts of these sorts mm. of places, cases. For sure, and listen to our podcast all the time. Eh? That's a good start. Well, uh, yeah. it's, it's great, isn't it? I mean, kind of what what did we do before podcasts? Because there are so many that you can listen to that are really <laughs> worthwhile, um, and 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 you can just go back and do it again and read it again and listen to it again. And it sends you off somewhere else. Yeah, it's brilliant. I don't think I'm a very good addition, clinician now. Can you imagine how bad I was before podcast? <laughs> the time you think you're any good is the time you need to stop. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah. Go on, Mike, we keep cutting oh, you off. I was just saying, Jack, is in addition to listening to the podcast, they should also attend your course and get the rheumatology <laughs> booklets. Yeah, they should. That's very good selling. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> While we're on that, is there anything you, you want to promote, David? Like, have you got a website or social media or anything like that? No, I'm on Twitter at David Goyet. Um, it's a mixture of kind of, yeah, a little bit of clinical stuff, um, but nothing. No, I've got nothing to promote other than, yeah, foot health. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, I think I'll, um, let's leave it there. I, do, I think it'd be really good to get you back. Um, David and talk about um, stress fractures that'd be good fun um, yeah be fascinating but certainly somewhere that I'm the foot is something that I'm not massively confident in with my regards to my assessment I'm much happier around the spine I think so um, it'd be great to pick your brains on that um, and have you back it's been a pleasure to talk to you and hopefully a lot of people got got some good information from this and be more confident with feet than they were before I hope it's been useful the other thing I would say is that I mean again we're in strange times I've never known any of my colleagues who, when asked if someone can come into the clinic, has ever said no. So talk to us. If you don't know us, just knock on the door and come and speak to us. And, and that, that cross-fertilisation goes a long, long way. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks, guys. It's been a mm-hmm. pleasure. David, thank you for your time. And Thanks your a lot. Thanks for inviting me. No worries. Cheers. Brilliant. Bye. Cheers. Bye.